welcome to First Presbyterian Church, our 11 o'clock worship service. Grateful that you are here today, that together we can worship the Lord our God. Amen? Amen. We just have a few announcements before we begin worship today. The first is a debrief of yesterday, the food distribution. Uh, it went very well, and um, it went very quickly and smoothly. And so we managed to uh, feed in between 250 and 300 families. Uh, just so, you know, the need is great and it continues to be great. So uh, we are just blessed that we can uh, offer that to this community. So grateful for all those who came out and volunteered and made it such a smooth pro process yesterday. Um, a reminder that our mission fundraiser, which was scheduled on the 27th, uh, a week yesterday, uh, is cancelled. So please just make a note of that. Uh, there was still a little bit of confusion around that, but uh, it is cancelled, so please uh, take that off your calendar if it is on there. Um, a note of sadness from this past week, Doris Yankee, a long-time member of the church, entered into her Easter life this past week, and so we just ask that you keep the family and friends in your prayers. And also, the service for Bill Bailey will take place on May the 4th uh, at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So if you want to attend Bill's celebration of life, uh, that'll take place on May the 4th. There are no other announcements this morning, and so let us take a deep breath and let us prepare to worship the Lord our God. stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord leads us in right paths. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. Come, let us worship God.
Friends, we come to this place as imperfect people, people who mess up, who make mistakes, who do things we shouldn't do and leave things undone, the things that maybe we should have done. Now God sees all of this and still chooses to love us anyways. So with confidence and uh, assurance, let us now take time to confess our sins before the Lord. Let us pray. God of love and truth, In trust, we confess our sins to you. Instead of loving one another as you have loved us, we damage one another with our words and deeds. We utter lies and speak against one another, and our deeds are self-serving. Forgive us and turn us around. Abide in us as we seek to abide in you. Friends, Hear and believe the good news that as far as the east is from the west is as far as the Lord has removed our transgressions from us and that through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. And I would like to invite, if there are any children, to come on up for the children's message today. Hey guys, how are you? Are you guys good today? Yeah, good. So um, today, uh, last week, I talked a little bit about how we are like sheep and how Jesus is the shepherd. Have you heard that before? Yeah. And um, so sheep, we are supposed to listen and follow our shepherd because he's there to help us. And so I wanted to play a little game with the congregation, and you guys can play too. And it is called uh, Shepherd Says. It is just like Simon Says. However, uh, we are going to play it as Shepherd Says. So are you guys ready to play? Choir, you guys can play too. So Shepherd Says, put your right hand in the air. Very good. Look at that. Okay, now put your right hand in the air or the left hand. Oh, some of you put hands down. I caught. I did not say shepherd says. Hmm. Okay, shepherd says take your right hand and touch your head. Good. Shepherd says put your left hand in the air. Good. Now keep your right hand on your head and then rub your tummy. I got something there too. All right, good job. You can put your hands down. Oh, I got all of you except for Pastor Michael. But he has played uh, the last time. (laughs) Okay, Shepard says that you can put your hands down and the game is over. So good job, guys. So have you ever played Simon Says before? Have you guys played that game before? Have you played that, Gwen? Simon Says, it's a fun game. And sometimes we're really good at listening and we can do it really well. I saw some of you are pros at this game. But some of us tend to mess up sometimes, and that's totally okay. And that's kind of like how life is, like where God will tell us to do something, and we'll try our hardest to listen and to do those things, but sometimes we get distracted, we listen to other people, or sometimes we just don't hear what God is telling us to do. Now, that's okay because God still loves us anyways, and we don't uh, get out if we mess up. We get to try again. But we need to remember that as good sheep, we need to be listening to our shepherd, which is God. Okay? All right, let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you that you are the best shepherd. A shepherd that will keep us safe and lead us on the right path. So God, as we do our very best to listen for your word, continue to help us and remain patient as we try to be good sheep. It is in your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you can head off to your retreat.
if you have your Bible with you or the Pew Bible in front of you, our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts. We're going to be reading from chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. Listen to what the Spirit is telling the church this day. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and are asked how this man had been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no other else, no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Just now take a moment to take a deep breath in, just breathe, take that deep breath out, and let us prepare our hearts um, as we go before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. God, we take this opportunity now to thank you for every day, God, because we know that every day you give to us is a blessing. Lord God, sometimes it can be hard to see all of the blessings and the gifts and the beautiful things that are going around us. So God, we take this opportunity now to just bask in the blessings. God, we thank you for those unexpected meetings, those small gifts that are sent to us every day to just shine a little light into our lives. God, we are so grateful, and although overlooked, we are so thankful that you love us and send us brightness every day. But God, we get distracted by the heavy and hard things that are happening around us. And when those heavy and hard things happen, we cling to you. So God, although we are so grateful for the blessings, we also take time to to ask for your help, to come to you for comfort in those situations that feel too big for us to bear alone. For God, we know that we are never alone but we ask for that comforting touch, for your healing hand, for your presence to be overwhelming. God, help us to unpack those heavy and hard things that cause us pain or stress or anxiety. God, we ask that you take them away or that you give us the tools and the power to stand against them. God, we pray for our community. We uh, just thank you so much for the food distribution yesterday, God. I thank you so much for each and every volunteer that was able to make that event happen. God, I thank you uh, that people show up to shine your light when asked. God, I also pray for every person who lined up to get food, um, And we pray that as they receive the food, that they also receive your love, that they are spiritually and physically filled with your love and your light, um, with the food boxes you were able to give out. God, we thank you for um, the gift of being able to reach out into our community, but we know that it is impossible for us to reach them all. So God, we pray for those people who were not able to make it yesterday, who are in need in our community and maybe haven't found us yet. God, send them our way and empower us to be a good neighbor to those in our community. God, it is not just our community that is suffering. It is our state, our country, our world. Our world is broken and full of hard things. But God, you promise us peace. And until that peace comes, 
we pray that you empower us to do your work, that we are good stewards of your love and we shine everywhere we go. God, we thank you that you have given us the tools to do so. And as we try to be good sheep, Lord, be our shepherd and guide us down the right path. Lord, we pray all of this the way that you have taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have many opportunities to be able to give back to God. We can give God through our finances, through our gifts and talents, and even our time. So friends, today I invite you now to give what you can through your gifts, your tithes, and your offerings. May the ushers please come forward.
ever living God, we come before you with thanksgiving upon our hearts for who you are. We bring what we have, Lord, our time, our talents, our treasures, and we ask that you take and use them, Lord, for the work of your kingdom in this time and in this place. That you would take what we have and use it in ways far beyond our imagination, but all for your glory. And now, Lord, silence in is the noise of the world. Help your spirit to roam freely around us and within us, that we would be guided in the direction and path that you would have us go. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about unity, and last week, Casey spoke about the fact that Jesus isn't going to say, I told you so. Jesus has given his life for us. We have been given a freedom and a forgiveness, and grace abounds. And there's a response that comes from us as a result. What is it that we do when we come to understand who Jesus is as our Lord and Savior? Casey also compared us to sheep running around a car in a circle. Dumb sheep. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's just how we can behave. We can just run around and follow the patterns of the world in the absence of our Lord and Savior. Our text today talks about Jesus as the good shepherd. We look at words from Jesus that challenge us as how we go about living life. By not embracing Jesus' words, we can indeed run around a car like those sheep. We are challenged in the way that we look and engage with others that do not necessarily agree with us and our understanding of what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. And the truth is, we are not just followers, but we are disciples. When we come to understand who Jesus is as our Lord and Savior, we are to begin the journey. It's just the beginning. It starts to move towards how Christ acts, to be more Christ-like in what we do, which means learning from Jesus as we live life. So let's read our scripture reading this morning from John's Gospel. We're going to be reading from chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. And again, listen to what the Spirit is telling the church this day. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again, and I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. One shepherd, one flock. Our scripture says it the other way around, one flock, one shepherd. Oneness. Oneness in understanding who Jesus Christ is, and with that oneness, if we accept Jesus as the one shepherd, then we also have to accept the one flock. Seven of our eight verses in our text today refer to Jesus and reflect on Jesus as the good shepherd. The one verse, verse 16, which engages with the flock is very, very rarely reflected upon. We like to reflect upon Jesus being the good shepherd knowing that he lays this down and has laid down his life for us. We contrast that with the hired hand who runs away when the wolf turns up, the sheep are scattered. The hired hand is unwilling to lay down his life because the text tells us he doesn't care for the sheep. He runs away. We embrace Jesus Christ as the good shepherd who has 
laid down his life for us, this good shepherd who is one with the Father. As I said, seven of the eight verses reflect on the good shepherd motif. And we've heard that time and time again. We hear the the term shepherd in the Old Testament and come to understand what it means, those who lead the people, and Jesus sets himself above all of them. The good shepherd who lays down his life. As I said, verse 16 is more often ignored than not. In the context, as Jesus was speaking to a, a, a crowd of Jewish people, we can take that the fold that he's referring to is the Gentiles who, who those who are listening have no concept will be included into the kingdom. That their knowledge of who God is was for them and for them alone. And we, as followers, as believers, know otherwise. As Paul and Peter proclaimed, as Jesus told time and time again, the Gentiles will be included. And, and this other fold then is included in Jesus' words today. And yet ever since then, ever since that understanding that the Gentiles would come into and be part of Christ's kingdom, we as humanity have been creating multiple folds in the opposite direction. We have been dividing We have been divisive. We have been separating. And so that which Jesus made as one, we have taken and made into many. We try and help the living God out. We have our opinions. We can surmise at what it is that Jesus is saying. We have our own explanations, our own agendas. And they are not God's. The reality is Jesus speaks is that Jesus' as one flock includes everybody. When we, humanity, tend to talk about a one flock or a one fold, it's, it's those who are akin to us, those who look like us and agree with us. And our flock or our fold excludes because others can't come in. And yet, at one and the same time, we are all believers in Jesus Christ. We have all come to accept who Jesus is. When we focus on our differences, when we focus on our theology and our doctrine and our understanding, we divide. We create many folds. And we're pretty good at it. Given that we've had some 2,000 plus years to, to consider what it is to be a follower of Jesus, 500 plus years since the, the Reformation, and again, that sense of coming together has been exploded into many. It seems to be our humanness, our propensity to focus on the differences we have instead of those things that draw us in common. One flock. And we have lost sight of what Jesus truly spoke about, what that means. It's quite obvious. One. That's it. And yet, is hard for us to live into it. We have so many iterations, so many variations that can be divisive. And it runs deep into our psyche. I've shared this story from Emo Phillips, the comedian, before, quite a while ago. Emo was speaking to an individual And he said, Protestant or Catholic? And the response comes, I'm Protestant. And he says, me too. What franchise? Baptist. Me too. Emo's on a roll. 
Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist. We're together. He says we continue to go back and forth. And finally, Emo asks, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? The response came, Council of 1912. Emo's response, die, heretic. Why do we focus on our differences so easily? It's like we want to create division. And it happens not just out there in the world, but it happens within us that we, those of us who call ourselves believers in Jesus Christ, we find different ways and different understandings of what that means. And and if someone else doesn't agree with that, then we go our separate ways. We're not in competition with one another as believers in Jesus. Competition is the way of the world. Oneness is the way of Christ. And yet they so easily come into conflict with one another. We're not in competition. Our text points out that both folds have things in common, that they know Jesus' voice and they listen. They know Jesus to be the good shepherd. They know that he will lay down his life for them. Is that not enough? For us to come into agreement with one another? And yet we struggle. We struggle to even acknowledge that we are one fold, let alone there being another fold that will join us to make us one. We create the differences as humanity. Divisiveness revolves around the So what does it mean today? Do we just simply send this text back 2,000 and say, you know, clearly Jesus was only talking about the Jews and Gentiles, and now that bit's ticked. We got that box ticked by his sacrifice on the cross, and we all know that we can be believers in Jesus Christ. We're good to go. All the work has been done, none of it by us. And yet, we take that and we create division. We stick into reverse what Jesus has stated. And it's magnified around the world. We, the Gentiles, have become many, many folds by our own volition. Can we even conceive of the idea that Jesus made us into one? especially when we focus on our differences. Jane Vanya, who's a Methodist, tells of the time that she became active in a Baptist church when she moved to a new community. Many people do go to a different denomination and get involved with different churches. She says, one day I was helping a group of women clean the church kitchen after a social event. And she, emptied, and she said, I emptied the large electric coffee pot and handed it to the woman washing dishes. She asked, can this be washed like everything else? Jane answered, no. This is a Methodist coffee pot. It says right here, do not immerse. We take aspects of our theology and we put so much focus on it. And we laugh at those words that I just said, but we turn the clock back 500 years and people were killing each other because of the different understanding of baptism. We have that propensity within us. We also have the propensity to gather together around Christ. One shepherd. One flock. We focus on Jesus. For God so loved the world, all of us, that he sent his son. 
John 14 tells us there is no way other than through Christ to the Father. Our text today in Acts, there is no other name by which we are saved. We call upon the Lord as our shepherd in Psalm 23, as our call to worship today. Together, in unity, one shepherd, one flock. And when we do that, then, then all the debates and, and all the arguments and all the variations on the theme, they go away because we focus on the one shepherd. The things that we see as important, those things that we raise up, aren't important. What's important is our understanding of who Jesus is and what that means to us as we live life. What happens to our sense of right and wrong? What happens to the specter of sin in all its varieties and forms when all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? And we choose just to focus on a few. The few that we most disagree vehemently on. We hold others accountable for falling short of the glory of God when we have a plank in our own eyes as we look at others. Well, Jesus says to us, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. Brothers and sisters, we are guilty of creating fold within folds. Jesus says, judge not lest you also be judged. And that's not to say that we don't follow those things that we come to understand, that, that we don't follow the things that we are led to follow. We don't remain in our sin. We become more Christ-like as we are led through the Scriptures. We are accountable for our actions. But Jesus makes it very simple. Salvation is God's work. And those other things, as important as we make them, aren't. Because the cry is for us to be one flock. It's not about us. Yes, we are to become more Christ-like, but that is the journey that we undertake once we have received salvation through Jesus Christ. Barbara Essex, in her commentary on this text, says, John makes it clear that the work of gathering the flock belongs to Jesus and God. We are to provide a space where all are welcome. The community that John envisions is open and celebrates its diversity as a gift from God. He envisions multiple churches united in their loyalty to Jesus Christ, gathering at God's table, bringing all of who they are and sharing in the grace and mercy available through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And Barbara continues, the good shepherd is a powerful image for us who hunger for connection in a society that values individualism and secularism. In our moments of loneliness and isolation and alienation and hopelessness, the Good Shepherd responds to our deepest yearnings for community by offering an alternative to our fears, our separations, and our insecurities. In order to rid ourselves of the plague of division, which is so prevalent, we are to focus on the One Shepherd, the Good Shepherd, because when we do, as disciples of the Good Shepherd, we also have to embrace the one flock because that's to which we belong. And when we do, well, then Jesus has the last word. And we live in harmony and unity with each other. And sisters and brothers, as we wait for Christ's return, and we live into the oneness of shepherd and flock, then the world becomes a better place. And all of God's people said, Amen. One of the aspects of being in that better place, togetherness, is a peace that surpasses all understanding that's given to us only by Christ. He gives not as the world gives. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us stand and let us offer that peace to each other.
brothers and sisters, <clears throat> as we come to this time to gather at the table, we recognize that this table is the opportunity that we have to come together as one flock. That it doesn't matter where we are, those are all around us, those in their own places of worship, and we don't question what denomination, what building they're in, where they've been, what their circumstances of life are, they, they come to the table. We even gather with those who have gone on before us and are with Christ by the power of the Spirit, and we are with the, by the power of the Spirit with Christ as well. So we all come united as one, a foretaste of the great banquet at the end of time. And that is what we remember and celebrate as we come to this table. Let us pray. All holy and ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise. You are a mighty God. We are grateful, Lord, for all that you give unto us that from the very beginning of time it was always your intention to be in right relationship with us, knowing that it was going to cost the life of your son. You gave us opportunity time and time again of our own volition, and we failed, we wandered, we questioned, we walked away. But by the power of your son and his life and death and resurrection, you brought us back into unity with you, into right relationship, Lord, and for that we are grateful. Grateful, too, for the power of the Holy Spirit that resides with us even now, around us and within us, that guides our hearts and minds to you, that guides us in the path of life, that we would do the things that you call us to do, that we would indeed be a people, be a one flock people in your eyes and in our own eyes. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus in the upper room with the disciples, after looking up and giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat all of it, and when you do so, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured out the wine. And he said that this, this is my blood. It is shed for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. And when you drink from it, do so in remembrance of me. And whenever we eat the bread, whenever we drink the cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. This is God's feast for God's people. And we'll serve the choir first and then invite you to come to the table. Into this side.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you so much that we are able to come and participate in the sacrament of communion. God, as we taste and take this cup and this bread, we pray that we are spiritually and physically filled, filled with your love and your light, so that we may go from this place and shine to all who hear. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ as he stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. Knocks that we would open that door to him and indeed proclaim him King of glory. If you'd like to profess or reprofess your faith or simply talk about what that means, please get in touch and we can have that conversation. Brothers and sisters, we enter into this world. We enter into other believers. There are so many things that we could focus on that make us different, that separate us. Christ calls us to one shepherd and to one flock. So as we go out from this place, let us live into that in the best way we possibly can. As we go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you every moment of each and every day. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.